Welcome viewers to Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, for the ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future Conversation. And today we have right here in the studio two acti activists about nuclear weapons, nuclear power, nuclear waste. Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear, uh, radioactive uh, waste watchdog. Welcome back, Kevin. Thanks it's so, so good to see you again. You too. And Alfred, Alfred Meyer from Physi Physicians for Social Responsibility. Welcome to Burlington and Pleasure welcome to, to Nuclear Free Future Conversation. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for making the trip up from Grafton, Vermont today on a beautiful, a beautiful warm, warmer winter day. So, mm -hmm. and, and uh, our other guest is... is uh, our nuclear watchdog, Clara. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Hi, Clara. So the title for our show is Nuclear Disasters, Nuclear Weapons, Power, and Waste. So start us off, Kevin, with how these three are combined. They're all under the title of disasters. Mm -hmm. So well, um, nuclear power and nuclear weapons are inextricably interlinked, and we can talk more about that in detail. Uh, one of the most amazing revelations of this reality is that Ernest Moniz, who was President Obama's energy secretary and is now in the private sector, so to speak, um, came right out and said it recently, that we have to keep nuclear power going in this country if we want to maintain our nuclear weapons stockpile. The know-how, the technology, the infrastructure to keep the weapons ready to go would require that nuclear power keep going. And what's amazing about it is that it's a reversal of decades of supposed policy in this country, that the two are separate. But nuclear weapons watchdogs, nuclear power watchdogs have long been pointing out that the, the connections are widespread between the two. And in fact, it goes all the way back to the beginning. So. Of course, waste is generated both by atomic reactors and by nuclear weapons production. And a lot of people think that the nuclear weapons issue is a thing of the past, if only. <laughs> I mean, the headlines these days with the Trump administration pulling out of the INF, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and then Russia immediately saying, well, then we're pulling out too. And there's even, I mean, incredibly, the Trump administration is uh, beginning new weapons production in uh, Pantex, Texas, what they're doing is they're taking the hydrogen bomb secondary out of a uh, existing nuclear warhead called the W76-1, making it a new warhead, the W76-2, which means it's the primary, it's the fission trigger of a hydrogen bomb that's still gonna be in there, and they're gonna be deploying these new weapons, which are called usable or small yield nuclear weapons, to submarines on cruise missiles and the whole notion that the Trump administration is putting out there is we have to counter this move by Putin, this move by the Russian military to have usable, small yield, tactical nuclear weapons for battlefield use, but we're gonna match them so they won't dare use them because we have them too. So unfortunately, that waste coming off of the nuclear enterprise, both power and weapons, is very relevant today. And Alfred, you are a physician for social responsibility, and uh, this organization goes way back. We right? do. This yeah. PSR uh, was first active in the early 60s in an effort to stop atmospheric nuclear testing because of the fallout uh, radiation was found in young kids' teeth in Boston from the tests that were being done in the South Pacific. So this illustrates how this is really a global issue of contamination with radioactivity. And just to highlight what uh, Kevin just said, we have to remember that nuclear reactors were conceived of, designed, built, and operated, first and foremost, to make the materials for nuclear weapons. So this has always been this inextricable link. And right now, the nuclear power industry itself, as a standalone industry, is in steep decline. It's really going out of business. And so this is why there is this renewed push to keep nuclear power going so that we'll have the infrastructure to allow for the new weapons that uh, Kevin alluded to. And there's a, a, a big issue here about language. Atoms for Peace comes to mind, right, where Kevin, Atoms for Peace was when they were pushing nuclear power 
as a way to go for, for peaceful, uh, a peaceful world. And well, one of the yeah. most powerful books on this subject matter I've ever read is by Dr. Arjun Makajani of Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. It came out in 1999, and it's entitled The Nuclear Power Deception. And he looked closely at the history of Atoms for Peace, the famous or infamous speech that Eisenhower gave at the United Nations General Assembly in 1953. And essentially, the message I took from the book is that it really was a public relations campaign from the very beginning. And in fact, I mean, if you think about it, the only reactors, as Alfred mentioned, in the early years were weapons material production reactors. The, the first civilian reactor in the country was 1957, Shippingport, Pennsylvania, now a part of the Beaver Valley nuclear power plant near Pittsburgh. And the problem was that it was built by the Navy. Admiral Hyman Rickover built that with his nuclear Navy men. But that was supposedly the first civilian reactor, made electricity for a local municipality utility system. So the, the growth of nuclear power didn't really get going until the 1970s. There were a handful of reactors, uh, Dresden Unit 1 in Illinois, Big Rock Point in northern Michigan, but it was a very small number, a very small amount of uranium fuel being used in those atomic reactors. So the point of this book was, where was all that uranium going in those first decades of this so-called Atoms for Peace project? Well, the uranium mines, the mills, the processing was going into nuclear weaponry. And uh, that was kind of the smiley face facade for this huge uh, expansion of all things uranium, which was feeding the arms race at that time. And since the 1970s, though, nuclear power very much despite its connections to nuclear weapons, its inextricable interconnections, it also has taken on a life of its own. So when you do have 100 or more operating atomic reactors in the United States, that is a large supply of uranium going into those reactor cores that undergo nuclear fission reactions and become high-level radioactive waste. And now we have over 80,000 metric tons of commercial high-level irradiated nuclear fuel in this country that we have no good answers for. So it's a mess on both sides of the coin. Alfred, can you speak to the, the mess that you're facing right now as an activist with Physicians for Social Responsibility? <clears throat> what is a primary, primary crisis that you see in front of you? Well, I uh, will talk about some opportunities that we have because uh, we are faced with this uh, potential destruction by nuclear warfare. And I think that, uh, that in talking about the Atoms for Peace, that was a very <clears throat> particular effort to put a smiley face. The world was horrified when we dropped a uranium bomb on Nagasaki, on Hiroshima, and a plutonium bomb on Nagasaki. Um, we, we had firebombed many Japanese cities, but the horror and the destructive power of these nuclear weapons is unprecedented. So there was this effort to put a smiley face on it. Um, let's fast forward uh, just in 2017 at the United Nations, there was a treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons passed. And this is a phenomenal accomplishment done by uh, the majority of the countries in the world, which of course are not nuclear countries, but they would bear the brunt of uh, a disaster from a nuclear warfare. So it's really been this remarkable accomplishment of democratic action in the General Assembly at the United Nations. And so we now have a treaty. We need 50 countries to sign on to the treaty and ratify it before it goes into effect. And it really is an endeavor to change the norm, to make it unacceptable to possess nuclear weapons in this day and age. Because the major nations, such as the United States, uh, United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, Russia, China, still use nuclear weapons as the basis of our defense policy. And so we need to change this norm and make it illegal to possess nuclear weapons. Acceptance of nuclear weapons, why is that? Why is it that the, our, the country, the United States, and all of the, of the uh, nuclear p possessive countries, why is it that we, as people, accept nuclear weapons? 
Well, I think it's because we are told that this is the dominant force, that if our country has the most nuclear weapons, then we're impervious, that nobody can attack us or we can defeat anybody else. But this is very short-sighted uh, thinking. Um, th uh, we could end all of life on Earth with um, a nuclear conflagration. Uh, PSR has a report out called Nuclear Famine. You can find it on our website, www.psr.org. It hypothesizes a small nuclear conflagration, say between India and Pakistan, where there's daily fighting in the Kashmir area as we speak. And both these countries have uh, nuclear weapons. So if there were a hundred small weapons, such as uh, the type used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this would create enough fire and dust in the atmosphere, aside from all the radiological problems, which are significant, but it would induce a 10-year period of global warming, uh, of uh, nuclear winter, so that actually uh, agricultural production would be diminished, and we estimate up to two billion, be as in boy, billion people could starve from just a small scale of nuclear conflagration. And what Chernobyl comes to mind immediately with, with a conflagration or the, uh, the uh, consequences of nuclear power. Do you want to speak to that, Kevin, at the moment? Well, um, there's a new book out about Chernobyl that I've looked forward to reading. I was able to read the first chapter online, and it's due out uh, any day now. It's called uh, Chernobyl Midnight, or Midnight at Chernobyl by Higginbotham, is the journalist, and apparently he spent 10 years working on this book. And uh, what I learned from just reading the first chapter was that the history of Chernobyl goes back to the 1960s. That's when they started to build it, or at least plan for the building. And yet, uh, Chernobyl is still regarded as the worst nuclear power disaster in human history, although Fukushima, you know, is ongoing as we speak. And uh, Dr. Yablokov, who happened to be touring the United States at the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl, which happened to be right after Fukushima had begun in spring of 2011, pointed out at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., where he was speaking alongside my coworker Cindy Folkers of Beyond Nuclear, and Eric Pika of Friends of the Earth. Uh, Dr. Yablokov, who's a biologist, a preeminent biologist in Russia, he passed a number of years ago. He pointed out that Fukushima could easily become worse than Chernobyl because of the population density of Japan alone. So we'll see. I mean, um, they're trying to keep a lid on Fukushima. They still have daily releases into the ocean of something like 80,000 gallons per day of radioactively contaminated water. They're sitting on uh, just vast amounts of highly radioactive wastewater in storage tanks. And Yablokov did point to Chernobyl at the ecological and human health uh, devastation caused by this explosion and fire at an atomic reactor and warned that it could, you know, be surpassed by Fukushima. And we're not out of the woods yet at Fukushima. I mentioned the wastewater. Unfortunately, the plan that Tokyo Electric Power Company and the Japanese government have for that vast amount of highly radioactive wastewater is to run it through filters, get out the radionuclides that they can, some 60 plus, but unfortunately there's 200 plus radionuclides in this wastewater and one in particular, tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen, at just mind-boggling concentrations in the wastewater cannot be filtered industrially. Maybe at an experimental level in a laboratory it could be taken out, but it's so labor and energy intensive that what they want to do is dump it in the ocean. They just want to let it go into the ocean under the assumption that dilution is the solution to radioactive pollution. But it would be a huge assault on the Pacific Ocean, which is the origin of life. It's also the source of vast amounts of seafood for human consumption. And the tritium would then bioconcentrate in the seafood supply, and people would eat it. And I would point out that we humans are about 60 to 70 percent water. Tritium is radioactive water. As Kevin mentions, it can't be filtered out or kept separate from non-radioactive water. So the question becomes, if you're 60 to 70 percent water, what part of your body and which part would you like the tritium? Your brain? Your heart? 
your lungs, your reproductive organs, and this is, you know, we're 60 to 70 percent water. So this is a, a real problem that's really not being studied and we, you know, we're, we're fast irradiating the biosphere, but without any kind of scientific study or rigor or even trying to understand what it is we're doing. Irony comes to, to mind here of, it's of the, the bombs, the American bombs, and the only bombs that were dropped ever on the Japanese people. And now the Japanese people are the victims of the nuclear power catastrophe. So yeah, it's not lost is, on you know, the Japanese. Uh, yeah. Groups like Green Action Kyoto and many others have led the fight before Fukushima began, but certainly after they've, they've redoubled efforts and gotten a lot of new support in Japan from the population who were told their whole lives from kindergarten on that nuclear power is inherently safe, nothing can possibly go wrong. And when Fukushima had a triple meltdown, uh, people realized they'd been lied to. And so the Japanese anti-nuclear movement grew by leaps and bounds. And it's really a miracle. There are, unfortunately, about five reactors operating in Japan that did restart after Fukushima in 2011. But that's out of a total of, at the time that Fukushima started, there were 55 reactors in Japan. There are currently only five operating. Those were in the strongest pro-nuclear parts of the country, where the Japanese government was able to get away with that. But the other 50 reactors were either destroyed in the catastrophe or the public will not let them be restarted. So it's a, it's a real miracle of grassroots activism because they're up against a very pro-nuclear government, uh, the, uh, the ruling party of Japan. Going back to uh, the 1950s, one of its strongest planks is pro-nuclear power and that was really urged on them, to put it mildly, by the U.S. government. And another connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons was that the U.S. had a nuclear weapons disaster, essentially. It was a test of a hydrogen bomb in the Bikini Islands, in the Marshall Islands, that went horribly wrong. And the radioactive fallout cloud, for one thing, fell on a Japanese fishing fleet. And fishermen were killed from radiation poisoning. Uh, radioactively contaminated seafood was sold across Japan. This was nine years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 1954. And there was a groundswell of protest in Japan at this treatment at the hands of the occupying military of the United States. And so the US CIA literally went into Japan to sell nuclear power. And that's where the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan took on this plank at its founding that they would be pro-nuclear power. They still are, and despite their pro-nuclear um, enthusiasm, the Japanese people have said, no, you cannot turn these reactors back on. Alfred, come in here about the, uh, the economic aspect of all of these, the nuclear power, nuclear weapons, nuclear waste. How, how is it that, that money trumps science and, and uh, reality in this? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think the part of the answer is somewhat easy. <clears throat> that is to say that if you believe that, the, that these weapons do give us security, uh, it's a fairly easy argument to make that, our, you know, what price our security, that, you know, we need to pay what we need to pay to be secure. Um, and so I think that's ultimately the major driving force behind things. Um, as I say that going down this path though with mutually assured destruction, having weapons on hair trigger alert that, uh, you know, the, our leaders have a few minutes to evaluate whether a warning of an incoming attack is real or not, whether they need to fire a response. And so the fate of the earth is going to be decided in just a couple of minutes. Uh, <clears throat> this is not a very sound uh, program. The question of how we can carry on this way though, kind of psychologically, is a more difficult one to answer. Um, there's a fascinating book called Plutopia where it talks about, Kate Brown, the author, talks about all the brilliant people that were out at the Hanford site, uh, the uh, nuclear engineers, all highly educated. 
how could they all just kind of miss the fact that they're creating this huge problem of contamination which will last for millions of years and that we really don't know what to do with. You know, you'd think that you wouldn't go out on an endeavor knowing that that's what's going to be, it will yield, but this is where we are. And I think it's, I asked the same question when we face climate change, the other existential threat to life on Earth. Um, you know, why, it's, climate change has been known about for decades and decades and decades. I first heard about it in 1974 in a public lecture. Um, why haven't we done anything about that? And there's an irony too in like research and development and in knowledge of what's going on. And the, all of the money for research and development from the Department of Energy, Department of Defense goes to creating nuclear power and nuclear weapons, right? And not on the consequences of these things, like research that uh, your compatriots have done on uh, the, the uh, radiation poisoning of, of the populations. Mm -hmm. And why And why is that? And is it because we have a, such a steep lear learning curve to, to, uh, to follow? I was at a commemoration of the Hiroshima bombing at Los Alamos in New Mexico in 1992, and one of the speakers was Ed Grothus, who was a whistleblower at Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. And he made the point that, you know, engineering, designing nuclear warheads, very sexy work, very prestigious. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the waste, not so much. And so mm -hmm. guess what? The waste never gets dealt with, <laughs> in, a, in a sense. And Hanford was just mentioned by Alfred. And uh, just the other day, the U.S. General Accounting Office, which is the investigative arm of Congress, put out a figure. What is the cleanup cost for the nuclear weapons complex in the United States from making the bombs all these decades? And the figure they put forth was $377 billion, with a B. And Hanford is a big chunk of that. Well over $100 billion will be cleaning up just the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington on the Columbia River. So um, yeah, it's, it's quite astounding. Uh, the same on the nuclear power side. I mentioned we have 80,000 metric tons of commercial irradiated nuclear fuel from atomic reactors like Vermont Yankee with no good answers as to what to do. The good news at Vermont Yankee is that the fuel has been removed from the storage pool, which is a catastrophe waiting to happen. And most pools in the United States are still packed to the gills. Even at shutdown reactors, they often keep the pools operational and full of waste. And the problem is if you lose the cooling water supply, whether quickly, like from dropping a heavy load or from a terrorist attack or a natural disaster, or even more slowly, the cooling water boiling away over days even until they can get control and they can't get control and it all boils away, exposing the fuel to air and then it catches fire. And the, the, again, the example to point to is Fukushima Daiichi. Unit number four, the storage pool there, very nearly caught fire. And it was through sheer luck that it didn't. And if it had, instead of 160,000 nuclear evacuees due to the reactor releases and the containment failures, that's what happened. The Prime Minister of Japan at the time, Naoto Kan, a year later was ready to admit that he had a secret contingency plan in the works to evacuate 35 million to 50 million people from northeastern Japan and Metro Tokyo if that Unit 4 pool had caught on fire. So the good news at Vermont Yankee, which is a Fukushima Daiichi twin, is that the waste has been removed from the storage pool. It's in dry casks. The bad news is that those dry casks, which are Holtec international containers, are of questionable structural integrity sitting still at zero miles per hour. And yet these are the very containers that are also certified for transport to propose dump sites out west. And they'll be going 60 miles per hour plus down the rail lines including through, uh, they're not just being exported from Vermont, but if you study the maps of the transport routes, there is a rail through southwestern, extreme southwestern Vermont, where not only Vermont Yankees waste would travel, not only Yankee Rose waste from just south in Massachusetts, but other reactors to the east and to the north would pass through Vermont on their way out west to Yucca Mountain, Nevada, or Holtec is proposing a centralized interim storage facility in New Mexico, Waste Control Specialists, now called Interim Storage Partners, is proposing centralized interim storage in West Texas. 
There are all these bad ideas for these Western dump sites. We're fighting them all tooth and nail. And it just shows that um, they entered into this little escapade of theirs, not knowing what to do with the high-level radioactive waste. And now we're left with the lesser evils of what to do. And here in Vermont, this is, it, it, viewers, it's happening right before our eyes that, that uh, Representative Welch has approved uh, the House Bill 3053, and that has passed in the House of Representatives, and that is the transport bill for nuclear waste to go heaven knows where, but there is going to go, right? Because Vermont wants to get rid of it. The good news about H.R. 3053, which was the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act of 2018, is yes, it did pass the House, but then it went nowhere in the Senate. There was no action taken. And that Congress ended. There's a new Congress. If they want to pass that legislation into law, they have to start all over again. They have to pass the House. They have to pass the Senate. We did, you know, even though we got blown out of the water last May, it was a vote of 340 to 72. 340 in favor. Representative Welch voted in favor, unfortunately. 72 opposed. Even though we got so creamed in that vote, I think we did a lot of good work. Uh, we, we've done more work since. We've educated member of, members of Congress. Uh, just one story from St. Louis, Missouri. We wanted to know why Congressman William Lacey Clay Jr. voted for this legislation. It just didn't seem to make any sense because St. Louis would be so hard hit by the transportation out west coming from the east. If you look at a map of the United States, 75% of the reactors and the waste in this country are east of the Mississippi River. And then if you draw a center line down the middle of the country, 90% of the reactors and the waste commercially are in the eastern half of the United States. St. Louis is going to catch a lot of this uh, shipment going westward. So we wondered why would uh, Representative uh, William Lacey Clay vote in favor of this? And it turns out, long story short, that they have their own radioactive waste crisis in St. Louis, but it's not commercial high-level radioactive waste. It's remnants of the Manhattan Project that were processed in St. Louis and then dumped all over town, illegally in some cases. And so now they have a landfill, Bridgeton Landfill, uh, West Lake Landfill, where there's an underground municipal garbage dump fire within hundreds of feet of Manhattan Project wastes in the same dump site in the floodplain of the Missouri River near the water intakes for Metro St. Louis with residential communities surrounding it and people getting sick, especially children. So William Lacey Clay was told by the sponsor of H.R. 3053 that if he voted in favor of this bill, those West Lake landfill wastes would go to Yucca Mountain, Nevada, which is not true. It is factually incorrect. Yucca Mountain would be for commercial high-level radioactive waste, not for Manhattan Project remnants like this. And so, simply, the congressman was lied to, and he did support it, but now he knows better as to what's really going on. So that's what we need to do is educate Congress that this magic wand of this bill is going to solve all the problems, it just ain't true. Well, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit more about what can be done, because the stories we've been telling are true, and they're qu pretty awful, uh, in my mind, if you l stop and look back and say, what's going on? This is not a pretty picture. It's not a good news. But for the entire history of the atomic age, there have always been very active and very wonderful people working for a more sensible path. And I think that's what we need to have happen here today is to, and, and with the change in the House of Representatives, that's a step in the right direction. There are currently three bills that have just been introduced. Um, one is H.R. Uh, 421, by, introduced by Adam Smith, and that calls for no first use of nuclear weapons. It's also being introduced in the Senate by Elizabeth Warren, uh, S-272. So that's one important thing that we're not, we're just saying we won't be the first ones to use them. A simple statement, but still important to make. Um, there's another uh, bit of legislation, H.R. 6840, called Hold the Line, and line is for the low-yield nuclear uh, weapons being developed. So this is calling for no more money 
to go for newer, more usable weapons. And this again by Adam Smith in the House and uh, Senator Edward Markey from Massachusetts in the Senate, S3448. And then the third one uh, that's just been introduced is to restrict the sole authority. You know, we are in a place now where President Trump on his very own can decide to push that button. And uh, many, many people feel that this is a very unwise circumstance to be in. So this is legislation, uh, it's called the Lou Markey Bill, uh, H.R. 669 in the House and Senator Markey S. 200. <clears throat> so again, this is calling for uh, a more sensible controls over how these very damaging and dangerous weapons uh, should be handled. This is uplifting news. Well, this, I, I'm a big believer that if, if I tell you about this terrible situation here, that I have to give you something to do about it because otherwise, if, if I didn't have my colleagues to work with and other people who know about these issues, I would go nuts knowing this information. It's just terrible information. It's, we're, we're, we're in a real pickle. But there are people, and many of them, and especially if you become active and start talking about it, you'll find that there are more and more who share your concerns and are willing to do something. And it's like with um, the United Nations bill to prohibit nuclear weapons. Uh, we need to push to get our country to join that. People laugh and say there's no way the United States would ever sign that. Well, let's make the United States sign that is what I say. Um, there are efforts to have uh, parliamentarians, uh, legislators of whatever country they're in, take a pledge to get rid of nuclear weapons as a parliamentarian's pledge. Cities are signing on in support of this treaty to get rid of nuclear weapons. Cities are the targets of nuclear weapons. Cities are the first responders to nuclear weapons. And cities know that there really is no response to a nuclear weapon. You know, you're... Uh, a huge hospital will have just a couple of burn beds available and if there was a nuclear conflagration well number one the hospital probably wouldn't be there anyway the doctors could be dead you know so we don't you know there there is no response to this we have to prevent it from happening and there's a campaign uh, called back from the brink which has uh, five action steps and it, you can find that at www.preventnuclearwar.org. But that talks about some of these same things about no first use and the sole authority and getting rid of weapons and whatnot. And, uh, so there are actually a number of different uh, efforts going on. And you can go to uh, organizations like PSR, like Beyond Nuclear, uh, many others. Um, that also will have information about what you as a citizen can do. And I think fundamentally the important thing is to really let your elected federal and state officials know where you stand, how you want them to vote on these issues, and uh, what direction this country should take. And I think, Kevin, you might be able to talk a little bit about what's going on in the Southwest because that is such a flashpoint right now for this very important issue of nuclear waste. We need to figure out something to do with it, but just doing something and not the right thing is a bad idea. Well, the, um, the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act now of 2019 could easily be reintroduced. Uh, even though the Democrats control the House, a lot of Democrats voted for last year's version. So we're going to have to fight the nuclear power lobby yet again. And uh, one way to do that is to educate people in places like Vermont that it's not just a question of getting rid of your waste, but in fact, other states will very likely in most places in this country be shipping through other states to get the waste out west. So we used to call this the mobile Chernobyl bill. This is very high risk activity. It's nothing to be rushed into. And then at the heart of H.R. 3053 last year were these environmental injustices of dumping the waste on Western Shoshone Indian land in Nevada or on Hispanic communities that are, you know, traditionally and still adjacent to Mescalero Apache Indian land in New Mexico and Texas, Comanche land. 
So these are non-starters from an environmental justice perspective to begin with. So we have to educate our members of Congress in both houses of Congress that these are bad ideas. And what's the alternative? Well, groups up here like Citizens Awareness Network back in 2002 held a conference in Connecticut and hardened on-site storage, a phrase that was coined by Dr. Arjun Makajani, was hammered out. It's now been endorsed. The Statement of Principles for Safeguarding Nuclear Waste at Reactors has been endorsed by 200 groups across the country representing all 50 states. And what it calls for is secure the waste, safeguard the waste where it is or as close as possible to where it was generated for this interim period, which could be years or even decades in duration, where we don't know what to do with the waste. So we shouldn't rush into bad ideas and rush it onto the roads, the rails, the waterways. We need to secure it where it's at, get it out of the pools, get it into a high quality dry cast storage uh, system that is fortified against things like terrorist attacks, that is monitored. None of that is happening right now. And one other positive development I wanted to mention is that um, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Democratic Congresswoman from New York, and Ed Markey, the Democratic Senator from Massachusetts, just yesterday introduced uh, a resolution in support of a Green New Deal on Capitol Hill in the Senate swamp. They held a press conference, so there were 30 members of Congress there supporting it. And uh, so this idea of a Green New Deal, 100% renewable power uh, in the near future, not the distant future, to address the climate and to address other things like human health and pocketbooks needs to be supported. Uh, people need to contact their elected officials and let them know to support it. But at the same time, people need to know that the nuclear power lobby in its power and its wealth is trying to insert itself into the Green New Deal. And we're going to have to be vigilant and, you know, prevent them from doing that. They've tried many times in the past. They're trying again. And uh, another uh, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research book from 2006 really ended this argument in my mind. Nuclear power costs too much and takes too long. It can't solve the climate crisis. And then the title of the book was Insurmountable Risks. Nuclear power has a very long list of its own insurmountable risks besides the fact that it can't solve the climate crisis. And if we waste, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars going down this dead end nuclear power path, that's hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars that should have gone into renewables and efficiency. And guess what? We just blew our last chance to solve the climate crisis. But the nuclear industry would love to take that money. That's what they're all about. And they're all about touting nuclear power as a green energy. And they've gotten away with that for so long. Spinning so, the splitting of the atom is yeah. what they do a lot of. Yeah, it's not <clears throat> the uranium fuel chain is dirty, filthy, and polluting from the get-go, from the mining of uranium. The Navajo miners have terrible lung diseases, lung cancer. Um, the milling, the refining, the enrichment, all the different steps that that has to go through are highly energy intensive and produce waste streams that pollute. Then even under normal operating, in, other, in, in fact under perfect operating conditions at a nuclear reactor, there is still regular and planned releases of radioactivity into the environment. So even without an accident or a spill or an attack, we're irradiating the biosphere. But I think in, in terms of the climate issue, the fact that you cannot build a new nuclear reactor in any quick time frame at all. I mean, the ones that are currently, the new ones that are they're trying to build around the world are fabulously over uh, budget and over time. It's taking two and three, four times as long to build them. So it's, it's not a quick and ready answer for us. Well, let's hope that the Green New Deal can turn all this upside down, right? So that we're viewing it as a, as a very positive future and not just something that is filled with crisis and catastrophe. And I think it could be this. It could be a uh, whole new uh, jobs program. And I think that we could make, you know, we'll call for big changes. So certain vested interests who are making a lot of money out of current situations 
some of those people are not going to make that money. But that opens up opportunities for other businesses to make a lot of money in more healthy and more supportive endeavors. And my hope is it's like, you know, the, this country got it together to go to the moon. We said it's important that we get, you know, a man on the moon and we did it. So why can't we have the same kind of commitment and enthusiasm and purposefulness to uh, come to a new energy system so that we can live comfortable, healthy, full lives but not be killing the atmosphere and the environment in which we live. And an important part of that, and Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez addressed this directly at the press conference yesterday, a just transition for those dying industries, whether it's coal mining or atom splitting, is an important aspect of the Green New Deal, this element of justice. And climate justice is a part of that too. And uh, another part of why nuclear can't be a part of the Green New Deal is, is this question of environmental justice, like Alfred mentioned, the Navajo, the Pueblo, a lot of the uranium mining that's taken place in the past has happened on indigenous people's land, low-income people of color communities. The current proposals for uranium mining are in many of the same places, in New Mexico and in Canada, in Australia. And so right from the get-go, right from the first step of the uranium fuel chain, uh, uranium mining, it's an environmental injustice and it's not acceptable. So it's a very hopeful vision and uh, the fight is on because, you know, these entrenched interests, like Alfred said, a lot of these companies, like First Energy in Ohio, for example, and Pennsylvania, is both a nuclear-powered and a coal-powered utility. Detroit Edison in Michigan uh, is both nuclear-powered and coal-powered. American Electric Power in the Midwest is the same. So they like to talk a good line out of their, their PR division about how clean their nuclear power is for the world, which isn't true, while at the same time they have massive coal operations. So the education part for the public and for elected officials to see through these lies and to demand genuinely clean, genuinely safe and affordable electricity from renewables. That's the future and it's not just theoretical countries like Germany, for example. Nuclear power will be phased out by 2022 that's a direct response to Chernobyl and Fukushima in German politics. Coal is, they now have an end date for coal burning in Germany for the most part, 2038, I believe is the year. Hopefully it can be sped up faster than that. But the fourth largest economy on the planet, Germany, is going renewable and efficient and it can be done. If they can do it, we can do it. This, this is very proactive and it's not reactionary to to the catastrophes that have happened and the crisis that could come. This is very proactive. And I'm, I'm so grateful to, to the two of you for coming here to the studio here in Burlington and sharing these ideas with us. And uh, we have to wrap up the program in, in a few minutes now. So could you leave us with a few words as we go into the future? And, and first of all, promise that you will come back, even if, if by Skype or FaceTime, because you are both from DC and the DC area, New York City area. So uh, we welcome you to Vermont and we cherish you here today. And uh, we want you to come back again. Sure. I would just encourage Vermonters who are listening to realize that your current congressional delegation, uh, Representative Welch, uh, Senators Sanders and Leahy, are Democratic leadership because of their seniority. Even though the senators are in the minority, they're still powerful voices in Washington. And so please let them know your feelings on these issues and urge them to continue to take action, to change positions that are not acceptable, like Representative Welch's position on uh, nuclear waste at this point because the people of Vermont have tremendous political power in that regard. Thank you. Alfred. It would be my pleasure to come back, uh, hopefully in person, and if not electronically. Uh, I want to thank you for having a show like this and having a discussion with your viewers uh, to make them aware of issues. And uh, just for us all to know that in this time uh, of history, you know, the outcomes, the, the direction things will go in depend on what the three of us and all the other people watching and 
what, what we do. And so do call up your elected officials. Make sure they know what, where you stand. Even if they're in agreement with you on something, give them the support. We, we have to push our leaders and give them the strength to know that lots of people are behind them so that they'll do the right things. But these are uh, crucial times for important decisions. Well, I feel stronger with, with this knowledge. And I hope that viewers, that you also feel the strength of, of knowing some of the truth of what's going on so we can move forward with a more optimistic viewpoint. And thank you very much for being here, Kevin and Alfred. Thank you. Till next time. Thank you, Channel 17. Thank you, viewers. Till next time. Goodbye for now.